In today's video, we're going to be learning about why strings can be mutated and why string literals cannot, and also how these two types deal with memory. When you're creating a string literal, Rust knows the contents of that string at compile time. So the text is hard coded directly into the final executable. This is why string literals are fast and efficient. And these properties are a result of the string's literal immutability. For example, we might have some text, which is equal to Bob. Rust knows at compile time that this will be three characters. It's not going to change, making it incredibly efficient compared to anything that can change, because anything that can change requires more processing. Now to create a mutable string, we need to allocate an amount of memory on the heap, which will be unknown at compile time. And that means that our computer is going to have to perform two operations. Number one, it's going to have to request the memory at runtime using the memory allocator. And number two, it's going to have to return the memory to the allocator when we're done with that string. The first part is done by us. For example, if we create some text once again, and this time we use the string from method and insert Bob, here we are requesting the memory that we need. And the second part is done by Rust as soon as we leave the current scope. And here I can just create a simple scope inside. So as soon as we leave this scope, the memory is returned and this text variable is no longer valid. Once again, if we were to try to use this variable outside of the scope, you'll notice that Rust cannot find the value text in this scope because this variable was dropped as soon as we left that scope. And when a variable goes out of scope, Rust calls a special function for us. This function is called drop and it's where the author of string can put the code to release the memory. So Rust will call drop automatically at the closing curly bracket. And this pattern hugely impacts the way Rust code is written. As simple as it may seem, the behavior of code can be unexpected in more complicated situations when we have multiple variables use the data we've allocated on the heap. So let's explore some of these situations. So here I'm going to create a variable called a, which will equal one. Then I'll create a variable called b, which will equal a. And this is going to make a copy of the value and bind it to b. And since integers are simple values with a known fixed size, this can easily be pushed onto the stack with no ugly surprises. And that also means that we can debug a and debug b. And when we open up our console and run the code, we will get the expected output. But now let's take a look at an example that uses string. So here I'm going to type in let original text equal string from Bob. Then I'm going to create a copy, which is called text copy, and that's going to equal the original text. Then we're going to try to debug the original text and debug the text copy. So that was pretty simple, except it wasn't. If we try to run this, you'll notice that we will get an error. And that's because in this context, it did not manage to make a copy. And this is taken directly from the docs. A string is made up of three parts a pointer to the memory that holds the contents of the string, a length and a capacity. And this group of data is stored on the stack. The length is how much memory in bytes the contents of the string are currently using. The capacity is the total amount of memory in bytes that the string has received from the allocator. The difference between length and capacity matters, but not in this context. So for now it's fine to ignore the capacity. And I promise we will dive deeper into what all that means later. But for now, what you need to know is that when we are creating this copy here, we're not copying the actual data. We are copying the string data, which once again is the pointer, the length and the capacity, not the actual data on the heap that the pointer refers to. And earlier we covered that when a variable goes out of scope, Rust automatically calls the drop function and cleans up the heap memory for that variable. If both original text and text copy were to point to the same location in memory, we'd have a huge problem here when we reach the end of the scope because Rust would try to free both of them from memory. And since they are both pointing to the same location in memory, you could end up with what is known as a double free error. And as good as that sounds, it's not a good thing. Freeing memory twice can lead to memory corruption, which can potentially lead to security vulnerabilities. So to ensure memory safety, Rust automatically invalidates the previous variable 
when a new variable copies its data. So a more appropriate name for the second variable here would be literally anything that doesn't suggest it's a copy. For example, here we can change text copy to name. And then what we're going to do is debug name and that's it because this original text over here is no longer valid. We cannot refer to that. And if we were to clear the console and run our script, you'll see that we'll get our name as an output. And what we did here is known as a move in Rust because we're moving the data from one variable to another and invalidating the first variable. And it's also good to know that by default, Rust will never create deep copies of your data. Deep copies are practically full independent copies of a variable. And this is usually very expensive since they have to copy every single piece of data inside a variable. So in general, if you copy anything in Rust, you can assume it to be inexpensive in terms of runtime performance because it's not performing a deep copy. But yeah, I know that was another text heavy lesson, but as always, I promise that we will get very comfortable with this as we progress with the Rust language. So that's all I'm going to talk about in today's video, and we will continue with ownership in the next lesson.